Pentecost, here the Holy Ghost is being poured out like cloven tongues of fire. That's a really important symbol to see, is the Spirit of God, the fire, the Holy Ghost, and then what you're going to see is that in every case when the, the, when the, the situation is Shavuot, they're going to be reciting the commandments because it was at Shavuot that the children of Israel arrived at Mount Sinai. And what did they hear? The commandments. The commandments for that my people need to keep. All right? You're going to see it in 3rd Nephi. And Jesus is going to give them the commandments again. So here we go. These are all Shavuot events. Um, when Israel, in the first case, when they came to Mount Sinai, you're going to see types and shadows there in that story all over the place. I'll show you just a couple. By the way, it was Shavuot when Jesus told the first, what kind of woman? What was she? A Gentile. She was a Samaritan. The scriptures are very clear on that because now the gospel is going to the nations. Who has to be the first one to break that, that ice? Who has to be the first one to bring it to the nations? has to be Jesus, right? And so he's going to bring it to the first Gentile that we have in Scripture, and then he's going to tell her something that he hasn't told any of Israel. She says, we know that the Messiah will come and fix things up. This is a mess. You know, they're so mean to us. And what does Jesus say to her? I am he. I am he. He hasn't told that to anyone else. And she's the first one that he witnesses to. So that's a very important date, and I'll show it to you. In, in, and then, of course, we just talked about the fire and the Holy Spirit being poured out and the birth of the church, really, birth of Christianity. 3,000 people were baptized that day, and remember, they were Jews. Okay? All of them. <laughs> and, and we always think, you know, all oh, those bad Jews. You know, no, they are our founding fathers, and guess what we get to be for them? Founding fathers that bring Jesus Christ back to them. All right, so here it is in Exodus. Check this out. Go into the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow. Two days. And on the third day, I will come down. Okay? You're going to see this all over Pentecost and, and, and this, this two days of the Gentiles. This 2,000 years. How long has it been since Jesus came? 2,000 years. <laughs> Remember I said it's almost time for the end of the wheat and the tares, okay? It, it, this, they all come together here, all right? So be ready. Be ready for the third day because I'm going to come down, and it's going to be real, and it's really going to happen. And on the third day in the morning, what did I say every time there's a resurrection? Earthquake. Earthquake, yeah. right? So remember, Adam on Diamond, it's, it's going to be a... A white knuckle ride from, from the way Pharaoh was putting So do you it, think okay? that's ripping the Mississippi up the middle? Is that where you think it's going to be, or do you not know? Likely. Yeah. yeah. Likely, but it's speculation, right? right. Okay. Makes a lot of sense. <laughs> um, there are thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud and the voice of a trumpet really loud. And that's a type, by the way. That's a symbol throughout Scripture. DNC 29. When it's talking about Adam and Adam, and it says um, that there, there will be a sound of a, a trump exceedingly loud as on Mount Sinai. That's a clue. It's probably Pentecost. <laughs> it's happening in Adam and Adam. And Moses brought forth the people to meet God, and the Lord descended in fire, and there's the whole mountain quaking, and the voice of the trumpet sounded long and loud, and God answered him by his voice. Okay? So this is not... The Holy Ghost anymore. This is Him. He's here. All right. Okay. So now we're going to John four. That's that that chapter where you have Him telling the woman at the well who He is. Right there, Jesus said unto her, "I that speak unto thee, am He." But I told you, there's every word in John chapter four is a prophecy. It's embedded. Jesus is actually telling you all about the time of the Gentiles, mm -hmm. in the conversation that He's having with that woman, even to that, you know, you've had five husbands and the one that you have is not, that's, that's the kingdom of the Gentiles. That's the five heads in Revelation mm. that are fallen and the one that's, that's now is Rome. And yeah, Pharaoh. That's now, John 4 is now up on YouTube. Oh, he, he put it up on our Prophetic Appointments channel now. You can watch it right, right up on 
on, on the internet now. But we go into this, we do a whole lesson just on this. We could do a whole lesson on practically every one of these slides. <laughs> okay, but look what Jesus says. The hour cometh. Now, whenever you see him say hour, I want you to think a judgment. Okay? okay. When it's called, what what is it called? The hour of judgment in Boy, all yeah. through Revelation. Boy, At the Boy, time Boy. of Christ, he kept saying, that can't happen now because my hour. hour hasn't come. When does he say my hour is? Here. It's the last week, mm -hmm. the last seven days. Okay, that's the hour, and that's when he takes our judgment on him. Okay, but the hour of judgment in the end time is seven years. I'll show that to you in scripture. Yeah. I'm just going to say that the translation is time. The time comes. The time of judgment, right? Okay, but Jesus is telling them that you're saying that, you know, that they're going to fix, the Lord's going to fix all this some way, someday, but I'm telling you the time now is. Okay? And the true worshipers now, now that we're moving into this time of the Gentiles, the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. Does it say, and you kept the law of Moses? No. It's a different missionary time. It's a different missionary field. Now, I want your broken heart and your contrite spirit. I want you to worship me in spirit and truth because if you do, then I can teach you my law. And then you'll keep my law because he, the, he, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You'll keep my commandments because you love me. He's showing us his love first so that we can be empowered to keep the commandments. All right? All right, so I want those that will worship me in spirit and truth. He says it several times. And then, oh, I forgot my dove. Sorry. <laughs> All right, and then we have some more really cryptic words. Wow, my dove is slow. Okay. This is what he says. He says, say ye not, there are yet four months, and then cometh the hardest. Behold, I say unto you, look. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. What does that mean? Did you know it's quoted like 15 times in the first sections of the Doctrine and Covenants? Mm -hmm. Did you know that the Lord is quoting that verse? Okay, so what in the world is he talking about? Well, number one, you got to know a few things about Shavuot. You got to know that they dress in white. See all the little girls? They like to put flowers in their hair and dress in white on Shavuot. Remember at Mount Sinai, he says, prepare yourselves, get ready. They were washing their clothes and ironing their clothes. They're getting ready to meet God. They're wearing white. Okay? All right. So this is the Samaritans today. That's right fresh off the internet at Passover, getting ready to keep the Passover because they still keep it in Samaria to this day. So, um, all right, why did I put this one up here? I had, oh, yeah, I, this is what I was showing you. Remember I told you, you count 50 days from first fruits to Pentecost, right? So Pentecost falls like in the very early June because these are spring feasts, right? Like Easter time, that this, these feasts are. And then that's going to hit right in early June, okay? And then if you count from June, July... August, September, October, where are you? You're now in the fall feast. Mm -hmm. You're telling me it's four months until the harvest, till I come again, to the second coming, okay? But I'm telling you, no. I got people out to harvest during the time of the Gentiles. They're, look, look at the field. They're white, so what was happening? Well, the woman at the well, what did she do? She went back and she started saying, he's here, he's here, he's here, come and see, come and see, right? Right. And it's Shavuot, so what's everybody wearing? White. White. And here comes all the guys in the city, in the village, to the well to see if it's him. And Jesus tells her, look at the fields. It's white already to harvest. And do they believe? <laughs> they say, yeah, we, we said we believed. We believed her, but now that we've talked to you, 
We know. We know. So because we are in the time of the Gentiles, because Moroni told Joseph Smith he was bringing in the fullness of the time of the Gentiles, that's why in all of the scriptures of the first missionaries going out, the fields are white, all ready to harvest. Thrust in your sickle. The hour is coming soon. That's what it's talking about. All right. Notice how long he stayed with the Samaritans. It says it twice. Two, Two days. days. <laughs> Duh, they just, that's just coincidental. That's just in there every time it's talking about the time of the Gentiles. Two days. Okay. All right. So, it's Pentecost. We've got the Holy Ghost being poured out in Jerusalem. We've got the birth of Christianity. We have 3,000 people baptized. Remember that when the law of Moses was given on Mount Sinai, there was a rebellion and 3,000 people died. If we have the law without Christ, without the Holy Spirit, without his atonement, guess what we are? Dead. But with his spirit and with his atonement, we live. 3,000 people lived at Pentecost. All right, so, but was Jesus there? Was he at the temple at that time, physically? No. Where was he? This is an appointment. We've got the Holy Ghost being poured out in Jerusalem. Where is Jesus? Oh, America. And now it came to pass that there was a great multitude gathered together of the people of Nephi around the temple. So who called the meeting? The cell phone towers were down. There's a lot of destruction. Okay. Why was everybody gathered to the temple on this day? Because they've been going to the temple for Pentecost for 600 years since Lehi came to America. This is a pilgrimage feast. There's three of them. They go for Passover, they go for Pentecost, and they go for tabernacles. And to this day, the Indians still have their harvest, green corn festivals. That's the, the spring one, that's the Passover one, and then they have a big harvest in the fall. I can't remember what it's called. Um, Nancy probably knows the one that they do in the fall. We went with Little Bear down to Oklahoma to watch them do Feast of Tabernacles in their tribe where they still built the sukkahs to this day, okay? All right, and yeah, they've mixed in a lot of really weird stuff too, but you know, there, there's some roots there, okay? All right, so all the people are gathered to the temple and they're marveling at the great and marvelous change. You guys know Avraham Gileadi, you know that every time the Book of Mormon says great and marvelous, it's a link to this transition, second coming, this Adam on Diamond thing when the gospel goes back to the house of Israel. It's great and marvelous. That tells you there's going to be destruction <laughs> associated with the great and marvelous, guys. Yeah. All right? All right, and they were also conversing about Jesus Christ. And what did they do? They heard, and it's Father's voice. Remember, he says, this is my beloved son. They hear his voice. This is not Gentiles. This is house of Israel. <coughs> All right. So when was he there? Which of the pilgrimage feasts was it? Was it Passover? Well, he was crucified on Passover. Do you think they were all gathered at the temple ready to have a glorious experience the day that their families were dying and being slaughtered all around them during the destruction? No. Number one, in the law of Moses, if you lose a family member, you have to be able to mourn for 30 days. It's part of, their, it's part of the, the law of grieving in the law of Moses. If we kept that, the, just their laws that they have for grieving, there would be a lot less psychological problems. I mean, honestly, the Lord spelled it. He understood the grieving process. He, 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 it's beautiful the way they handle it in, in the law of Moses. So they would have been grieving big time. So what do you know about that process? I have books on it, and I know they have to. Um, well, in The Chosen, you remember the, the, one of the episodes opens up, and he says, we're doing Shiva. OK, 
Teshiva is Sheva, it's seven. The first seven days, you stay home. You don't go anywhere. Your family and your friends and your loved ones, they bring you food, they, they, but you just wipe out for seven days and you cry, okay? For 30 days during the morning period, you're not supposed to go out to any social activities, okay? You don't have to stay home, but, and then they have different numbers of days that you're supposed to do different levels of, of of, of uh, what you're allowed to do. Like you, during that 30 days, no parties, no, no things like that, okay? So the point is, is that I seriously doubt it was Passover when, when Jesus came to them, okay? But it was a pilgrimage feast because they all gathered to the temple. All right, so the question is, what's the next one after Passover? Well, that's gonna be Shavuot, that's Pentecost, that's the time of the Gentiles one, okay? It's 50 days after. So what does the Book of Mormon say? It says, this one, I have people misinterpret all the time, I'll tell you why. And it came to pass that in the ending of the 34th year, remember he was four days into his 34th year when he was crucified. And now we're at the ending of that year, okay? It says, I will show you unto, that the people of the Nephites and the Lamanites, they had great blessings poured out on their heads. And so that's where people say, oh, he came at Tabernacles at the end of the year. That's the fall feast. That's Tabernacles, right? But that's not what it says. It says, in so much, and I would say that one interpretation of in so much is because as a result of that soon after the ascension of Christ into heaven, he truly manifests himself into them. Okay? So I can get that people are saying, no, he came at Tabernacles. And I'm like... No, he didn't come at Tabernacles. They're super blessed by Tabernacles mm -hmm. because he came at Shavuot. Look here. Behold, I am Jesus Christ, whom the prophets testify should come into the world. And he tells, I've drink, taken the bitter cup. And it came to pass that when Jesus had spoken this words, the multitude fell to the earth. And they remembered that it had been prophesied that he would come after his ascension into heaven. We read that we read over that in the text because you know he 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 comes down and then he goes back up and then he comes down again and we're we're just like whatever it's one of those no he's talking about he hasn't come yet so he he can't have ascended yet he's talking about the ascension in Jerusalem after forty days so it is uh, Shavuot and you can tell because check out the fire check out the Holy Ghost check out how many times Jesus is saying it to them and then check out this. He recites them the law and the commandments. He says, ye have my commandments now before you. You can be my people. Mm -hmm. Okay? So you can see, once you learn about it, you can start to pick them all up. Okay? So um, I kind of feel like everybody's getting tired. Do we want to take a break for a minute? We, we okay? Is mm -hmm. everybody? <sighs> yeah, maybe in five minutes. What do you think? I, I really think everybody's kind of getting tired. Yeah, you, you should no, I just only got six hours sleep. I totally get it, but, <laughs> but you're not the only one tired. There's a lot of people tired here. So just a couple That's why minutes. I have whatever. some water here. To walk, help walk around for a second. Uh, get your blood flowing. So, okay. Because we're, five minutes. We're about to get into the fall feast. So. Okay. Perfect. Super exciting. Grab a donut. <laughs> yeah, munch time. Is um, does anybody have any questions off off the record while we're while we're just circling into it? Yeah, it's just it, there's so much, and I'm just <laughs> yeah. oh, and you guys, are, so um, I didn't tell you we have seven two hour videos online on our website on your website on the fall feast where we actually go in and really nail into these prophecies and what's going on. And um, we just there to put up on YouTube at our Prophetic Point with YouTube channel. We're trying to kind of shift everything over to YouTube because it's, it's a, a more used platform. Mm -hmm. And we just put the three spring pieces up. And I have two on Shavuot recorded and in process of being edited within the next couple of months. We have hope to have all 14 of the 
show the world, uh, of the fall feast lessons up on the website. So it just okay. focuses on one feast. It takes and it one and it just drills in. So, so I'm just trying to give you the overview to see how the whole thing was a picture of prophecy from the beginning to the end. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I mean, and when you get into the fall feast, I mean, it'll start blowing your mind because <laughs> this isn't history. This is future. Yeah. And I, I'm showing you, look, this is going to happen. You know? Yeah. But even, even to understand that the wheat harvest is the time of the Gentiles and that it's coming to an end, you know, that's going to change the way you read your wheat scriptures. Yeah. You know, there, there's a lot of them. There's wheat in the tares and there's guys in the field and one is taken and one is left. And, yeah. And that, that's and, the Adam on Dion and when everything mm -hmm. changes. Yes. It's okay. what Isaiah, like it's, it's the great reversal mm -hmm. in Isaiah. In Isaiah it's called the deliverance of Zion is the fall of Babylon. Oh, wow. It's the destruction of Babylon. And yet that's why Daniel's numbers help you so much because you're like, well, wait a minute. If Babylon falls, how come it gets really, really, really bad after that? And you're like, well, you have to realize who killed Babylon. <laughs> yeah. It's the really, really bad guy. <laughs> but, but Zion got delivered. And so now we have a place prepared by God to rescue everybody during the really, really bad guy. Yeah. And he prepared a few missionaries to go out and help. So you wow. said something about the Antichrist is going to do a nuclear bomb. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's at the time, uh, just before ones. Adam on Diamond? So, during the first half of the seven years, according to Daniel's numbers, you have the harlot Babylon. She is choking the wheat. Remember in DNC 86, it says, she is the tares. The harlot Babylon. She's the one that's choking the wheat. So when we have a new world order with a harlot that's riding with ten horns that all agree to give their power to the beast uh, for the hour, for an hour, seven years. Um, that first part, she's actually persecuting anybody that won't buy in. Who are the people that are not going to buy into the new world order and the mark of the beast? You don't take the mark of the beast, you can't buy yourself. There's going to be people that aren't going to do it. Who are they? Me. Yes, yes, why? That's right. Good job. Why? How do you know the mark of the beast is bad? What told you that? The Jews scriptures. don't know this. They're going to take it's in it. Revelation. Oh, what book is it in? Book of Revelation. Which is in what book? In the New, New Testament. Testament. Yeah. Oh, the Testament. we the just targeted the Christians. We just targeted the Christians. They're going to be the ones that won't take the mark. Can I clarify? I'm going to miss this. Yes. The mark of the beef doesn't come in until the Antichrist comes in our second half, right? They're, the New World Order is not going to institute it in the next three and a half years. Yeah, well, are they? Okay, yes. what's the evidence for yes. that? Okay, so in Revelation 13, uh, I, I don't have the structures to show you. It's a great chiasm. It's in two panels. The first half is about the first beast, and you remember the second half is about a two-horned beast that comes up after the first beast with the, that came out of the sea with the ten horns and the harlot riding on it, right? So she gets to be the first beast. Then we have the other beast that comes up out of the earth, which means it's in nation. She's all nations, the sea, he's one nation, the earth, except for he's got two horns, so he's, he's in cahoots with somebody. A lot of people think it's the false prophet. He's a religion and a political thing merged into one. The harlot riding on the beast seems to be, um, she's religious, but we're doing it in the name of good politics and world food hunger. And if you don't participate in our new world order, you are guilty of starving children in Africa, right? Because it's a one world socialism. That's, that's yeah. the way they're going to sell it, right? Okay. And, but we're not going to take it because we believe in the New Testament. The Jews are not going to have a problem taking it. They're gonna, they don't have the New Testament, and the Antichrist or, or the new world order is going to basically say, you play ball with us and we'll let you build your temple. And we know that because they have to be able to build the temple for him the really, really bad guy to say, I'm sitting in your temple and I'm saying I'm God, We're right? The temple in Jerusalem. The temple in Jerusalem, in old Jerusalem. What happened during COVID? They all took Yeah, they don't really have anything that's, that's saying, don't play ball with these guys, they're bad. We do, okay? And so, um, so that is really, that's our test. 
Yeah, we got Adam and Diam and delivering us from that. Because the harlot Babylon, she is the tares. She is who's choking the wheat. How is she choking us? Number one, we can't buy or sell. Number two, we're being made to look like really bad people because we're not we're not, we're not working pinball. together yeah. with the world peace. So that thing. would you say you said that's the beginning of the seven years before the two thousand thirty one. Two thousand thirty one is Adam. So we're really talking two thousand twenty twenty seven ish. So I, I'm I'm looking at I mean totally jumping ahead. Can I ask a kind of well, I, we're on a break. So I, I look at we should get started again. Yeah, I look at uh, two thousand the election this year. That's going to be turmoil, and I I've got slides I'll show you. David so, David well, Whitmer the, says we go into civil put war. The three eagle heads of Ezra's eagle in this three and a half years, uh -huh. and things just get they go up. They well, the first one's bad. They come back down. Second one, third one. You don't agree with that? Mm -mm. Okay. Nope. No, because the last eagle head that's standing, in Isaiah, there's only one bad guy that's the last one standing. Who is he? The Antichrist? Yes, who is he in Isaiah? The king of Assyria. He, he's the bad, he's the but prototype. That's representing that's America, America, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, America gets slowly taken over. We're still the world power in the end. We're just being governed by him. You remember, two of those feathers go over to the right head. I would, I would argue that America's arsenal is taking over. Yes, yes. I uh, please be clear. Yes, go. It, not all our guys are bad guys. I don't think, but bad guys get control. I don't think the whole of the country exactly. Is more yes. Than chaos, yes. But the arsenal of America gets taken over. Yes, and so you you've got to have the last bad guy standing, and that in Ezra's eagle is the right head. It's the king of Assyria. Right. And he takes out the left head. Right. Okay. I, I, I've read that. And then there's tell. the big head in the middle that disappears in the bed Dies with pain. pain. Yep. What does that mean? That means it's a surprise attack. Right. They're okay. sleeping. They don't know that they're about to get attacked. No. And the attack is painful. Nuclear destruction is painful. I mean, if you're not at ground zero, that's a bad way, a way to go. Ask the people at Hiroshima. So, okay. according so, to your chart, it seems like the Antichrist comes in just before 2027. Trumpets, he takes power, opening the seventh seal, and the um, half-hour silence starts. I would Am say right? Adam on day Amen, he takes power. The fall of Babylon at the great reversal. When Michael stands, that's when he takes power. He's working with... The, the New World Order in the first half. Don't we have the Antichrist in America before Adam? Yeah, but he's, yeah. you don't know who he is. No, no. Okay, he's well. playing good guy, right? Because it says that he's a traitor, he's right. a vile person, he's treacherous, he's deceitful. I can give you a whole litany of scriptures no, about him. Also, but he comes in with flattering words right. and seduces us. So I think we're going to see him as mm -hmm. this person who's going to rescue it's us. He's a good guy, yeah. He's going to be invisible. Yep. And Daniel says that he goes for seven years of peace and violates it in the middle. It all fits. It's all part of it. So let's get started, Yeah, folks. let's go back. Come on. Can I ask one quick question about the Antichrist? Yes. Um, doesn't everybody love him in the beginning? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, He's a good guy. He really can't be Barack Obama or Donald Trump. He's not <laughs> already too polarizing. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They're too dumb. Um, he comes in I think he's he lays low at first. He's a little horn. Oh yeah. He, he comes in and takes over the other guys. He comes in quietly. Yes. He's a smooth okay. operator. He's a very smooth operator. Okay. And the only ones the only ones that are even gonna know that he's a bad guy is people that believe the book of Revelation. Right. Nobody else will know. <coughs> And who have the Holy Ghost. So you'll call us to tell us? You guys are all going to be saying, hey, hey we all you have H-G H Holy Ghost. Okay. <laughs> so there, there's Jesus. All right, folks, come on. Back back going. Somebody count down from 10. 10, 10 9, nine <laughs> 8, 7, 6, Five, four, three, two, one. Let's go. All right. Well, could you think the nuclear attack envisions the glory? 
they, they silos go off right. underground. Oh, okay. That's think, part of it. That's part of it. You think that, there's that could be part the of truck it? bombs. There's all kinds, but it's coordinated. We know it's coordinated. It says in Isaiah that it's coordinated from he he, he um, ascends to the clouds, most high. He, he's got some sort of coordination going on, like um, he uses a satellite or something to take mm -hmm. down the anti strike. You know, he we basically it says the windows open from on high. Okay, wow. and that's what it says in Isaiah. Okay. So. All right. Okay, so here they are. He's ascending into heaven. He says, wait till you're endowed with power. This is really cool. Words of Joseph Smith. Um, Jesus commanded them to tarry until they were endowed with power. This is being recorded by Wilfred Woodruff, January of 1843. Um, and the, um, he says that Joseph Smith said that the endowment was to prepare the disciples for their mission to the world. What do you think all those temples in Jackson County are for? to prepare them for their mission to the world and to bring people in to be endowed to, with power so that they can be translated. Because ultimately, if you want to make it into the millennium, you got to be translated or resurrected, one or the other. Okay? All right, and so right here by Willard Richards, at one time God obtained a house where Peter was washed and anointed on the day of Pentecost. So they received their endowment of power that morning and then after the <coughs> session was over they came down to the temple and everyone spoke in tongues and testified of christ and every man heard that testimony in their own language okay so this is this is a, a type and a shadow that when this happens at adam on Diamond, they will go out with power okay all right, this is Moroni telling Joseph Smith that he is about to bring in the fullness of the Gentiles. If the time of the Gentiles is two days or 2,000 years, what would a tithing of that be? 200 years. 200. So how long has it been from the restoration of the church to Adam on Diablo, 2030? A tithing. Yeah, it's a tithing. The fullness of the Gentiles. The tithing of the time of the Gentiles, okay? All right, this is Ephraim's patriarchal blessing that he's given by his, father, his grandfather, Jacob. And, of course, you remember he crosses hands, and Joseph says, hey, hey Dad, you got him crossed. And he says, nope, I don't have a cross. I got it right. Okay. And then he says his younger brother, Ephraim, shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. That's the, English trans that's the King James Version translation. Now, multitude in Hebrew is melo. And it actually means a fullness or that's which fills. That's why they translated it multitudes, right? And then we already talked about nations. Nations in Hebrew is goyim. Transliterated into English, that's Gentiles. So literally, Ephraim's patriarchal blessing says that he will be the fullness of the Gentiles. Is that crazy? Okay. All right, so let's talk about what's happening at the end of the time of the Gentiles, the end, what's pictured in the Feast of Shavuot. And this is literally when Ephraim goes to the rescue. Okay? All right, something else cool to consider. David, King David, was born and died on Shavuot. Well, wow. mm, that's cool. That means he's connected with it, okay? Just like John Adams and Thomas Jefferson both died on the 4th of July. Come on. Oh, Only God does these things, okay? <laughs> King David, the one who is the supposed to be the one the, the one that represents to to the Hebrews, to the Jews the one who was willing to invoke a Davidic covenant, who was willing to sacrifice himself to save Jerusalem, to save others. Now, I, all we think about is Bathsheba. That's besides the point. That's personal, whether you fall or not. But it has nothing to do with the Davidic covenant that he was willing to endure whatever God would put him through. Uh, think of Saul chasing him and, and everything he went through um, in order that... Jerusalem could be spared. And so he's a father of a Davidic covenant. And that's what the Lord told David could not be messed up. 
no matter what he did. It, it was a, a um, unconditional covenant with God. It's like bookends of his own life, with his life. Right. <laughs> okay, and then um, let's see. Then also on Shavuot, the, the, the Jews that are keeping these festivals alive today have the tradition they always read the book of Ruth on Shavuot. If, yes. Is that how you spell Shavuot? She misspelled yes, it, it up there. Oh, okay. wait. Yeah. So it should be V-U-O-T. Oh, U-O. Sorry. Yeah, Thank you. I will yeah, fix that. Right. Thank you. Because yeah. it's, it's spelled correctly in the yellow. Yeah, right. sorry about that. So anyway, but what, what I'm saying is, is the book of Ruth is a complete allegory of the time of the Gentiles. You did it fairly. Really? What? Yeah. Yeah. I reversed yeah. something. Yes, I did. Anyway, so, I mean, the whole thing. Naomi is Israel. Ruth and Orpah are the two daughters that she picks up during the time of the Gentiles when she's out of Israel. In the time of the end, there's ten virgins. How many of them are wise? Five. And how many of them are foolish? Five. Half and half. Always half and half. One at the mill, one take one. At the end of the time of the Gentiles, at the wheat harvest, there's a 50-50 split of the people that said that they were brides of Christ mm -hmm. when the persecution gets on and when the harlot starts, the tares start choking the wheat for believing in Jesus Christ. Okay, there's a 50-50 split and, and I can give it to you in a, a half a dozen places in scriptures where that is typed and shadowed. Okay, so the book of Ruth is, oh, we could do two or three lessons on the book of Ruth. So good, so good. So here's this. According to Jewish tradition, Enoch was born and the city of Enoch was translated on Shavuot. That's not exciting! <laughs> that means Enoch has something to do with Adam and Naaman. We know that. <laughs> yeah! I mean, oh, he's so cool. And they, they're basically saying, you know, as, as far as Israel proper as a nation is concerned, they kind of did a timeout when they rejected Christ at first fruits, and they've got a timeout for two days. But he really doesn't stink us. But some think he stink us, but some think he's dead, but he really isn't dead. But he's going to rise in the fall feast. So his timeout is this time of the Gentiles, okay? And so a lot of people feel like that for a lot of reasons, Shavuot is the timeout, and Israel is going to to be restored on trumpets, which I actually believe as well. Um, here again, I'm showing you that every one of these last five of the feasts, First Fruits, Pentecost, Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and Tabernacles are all appointments for resurrections. Mm. Okay? Say that again. They're all appointments yeah. for fruits, resurrection. Pentecost, First yeah. Fruits, Pentecost, and then the three fall ones, Trumpets, okay. Atonement, and Tabernacles. So just think about it. You had the resurrection at the time of Christ when he was resurrected. That was first fruits in the green, okay? The one at Adam on Diamond, clearly in, in Thessalonians, in the time of the end of the wheat harvest, there's a resurrection, and that one is Adam on Diamond, okay? Then these two, that one and this one, are celestial resurrections. Remember that those that were not ready to be presented to the Father with Jesus, they had to stay in the time out, okay? Um, same with Adam and Diamond. It says it very clearly in DNC 88 that some will have to remain. They, they, won't, be, they won't receive a, a reward or an exaltation at that time. Trumpets, that one we have in Revelation 11. We have two witnesses. They're dead, and then they are Risen. resurrected in front of everybody. And that's kind of your last big... If you don't repent now and get on the right side, you're about to get wiped out. <laughs> you know, wake up call, <laughs> okay? That one is another celestial resurrection in Jerusalem with, with whom I believe will be Moses and Elijah who have laid down their lives for their nation, for Israel, the father of the law and the father of the prophets, okay? And then you have the first resurrection. That's the sheep and goat resurrection on the Day of Atonement. Jesus descends on the Mount of Olives, we have a millennial day. We now sort who gets to stay during the millennium. What's the criteria for that resurrection? When I was naked, did you clothe me? When I was hungry, when the tyrant was reigning, would you risk your neck for somebody else? 
When I was naked, did you clothe me? When I was being persecuted, did you help me? Did you feed me? Or did you turn your back on me? That's the criteria. It's, it's this, the, charity. Yeah, charity the, and love. This is a terrestrial planet. This isn't a celestial planet where you have to have ordinances and, and, and covenants to say, this is a, did you clothe me? Did you help me? Did you do what was right? Okay. And then, of course, there will be celestial ones. Yes, Farrell? You just made that sound like it is right now. It is headed to a terrestrial planet. Yes, I'm talking Adam millennium, Adam. right? When, yeah, when Adam it, it, at Adam on Diamond, right. when the earth We're begins to ascend. Now. Yes, yeah. exactly. Okay, so what I'm saying is that resurrection has a different criteria than these three celestial ones, where they were ready, they were elect, they were ready to ascend with the Father. And then the one, the last one is the one at the end of the millennium. What resurrection is that one? That's telestial. Oh, yeah. Right? At the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, the Tabernacles represents the millennial day. It's at the end, that's when Satan gathers his host. So it becomes telestial again. No, no. That is a telestial, that's the opportunity for the telestial people to, to get up. out okay, gotcha. and, and bow the knee to yeah. Christ and not have to stay there for the second death. Okay, that one, you can see that each of the resurrections is getting bigger because this one is now for terrestrial people, they get to, they get to be bands of death broken. And this one is for celestial people. If they will bow the knee to Christ, their bands of death are broken. Bigger in quantity. Bigger in quantity. numbers. It's huger, okay, with each of the resurrections. Just like it says in DNC 76, the three celestial resurrections have to be first because why? What do Good the people know. have to do once they're resurrected? Teach. Help. Gather, yes. Help. They have to minister to those so that they'll be able to be to the terrestrial resurrection. And when they are resurrected, what's the work of the millennium? Save those guys. Don't leave them there. We gotta help them so that when it's time they can come out. The ministry is expanding. And that's the picture you get through all of the mm -hmm. prophetic appointments. Because at the end of the millennium. When Jesus turns the kingdom back to the Father. It's one of my favorite verses in scripture. He says, of all that you have given me, I have lost none. That gives me hope. For my kids. Yeah. For your kids. <clears throat> There's a plan to save them all. And it's by those that are willing, being willing to help the next group, and those that are willing, being willing to help the next group. Until so we're all sealed in in that millennial reign then, the, our children who are not righteous, who didn't do anything, who... They have the a timeout. They're, they're gone for that thousand years. They're, they're in timeout. It's sealed. So Satan is sealed chance. for a thousand years. They're so they're sealed up for a thousand years. Yes. When Satan is uh, loosed, loosed what are they with him? Are are they? In my the way I see it, when Satan is loosed, the gates of hell are open, and at that point they have to choose. They have to choose whether they're going to join the hosts. DNC eighty eight. Michael will gather his hosts, and Satan will gather his hosts. So they've been in timeout, but now they've been released as, as, as with Satan being released, and now they get to choose. They have the opportunity to bow the knee to Christ, because if they will, he will save them. He but promised. None, in a none of those, yeah, in a celestial glory. Yes. And that, that's right. not going to be on the earth, but it's going to be somewhere cool, a lot more right. cool than where they've been. Oh, yeah. So they're kind of, um, so... You said, I had a thought and then Farrell spoke and then... It's okay. Grab it back. It's okay. um, oh, none of the hosts of Satan can bow their knee. They're already... They've, yep. they've been cast out. They can yep. never come back. They're talked about in Revelation 20 when it says that those... It says the sea... Hell will give forth their dead and the sea 
will give forth their dead. You have to go to apocryphal scriptures and everything and find out that the fallen angels and everything, they were in the sea and the flood, and they just get time out all the way to the end. Okay. You see, they, 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 they weren't, uh, they, they've they already had their second chance. Okay. Yeah? Right. yeah. So I came across a quote some time ago by from Elder James Talmadge uh -huh. in a conference talk in 1930. Hell hath an exit. It does. And he says that God doesn't delight in our punishment and suffering. That they go, that spirits go to the spirit prison to be taught and instructed. And when they're ready to learn a better way, the gates of hell will open and the hosts yes. of heaven will rejoice as they emerge. So I believe yes. that many of our celestial spirits that have minor sins compared to, you know, murder, et cetera, et cetera, the doors are going to be opening throughout the millennium and they'll emerge into a terrestrial state when they've learned and embraced those principles and those ordinances. I don't think they all have to wait till the end. Well, I think that it is kind of like now, yeah. right? Now, anybody that was not resurrected at the time of Christ is waiting for the next resurrection, right? And so they are in paradise, right? There's, there's a happy place where right. you get to wait and there's a place that Prison. God in his mercy is letting you suffer there until you figure out you want to go to the yeah. happy place. But don't you think there's different levels in yes, prison? Yes, Like there's isolation for murderers and then there's, you know, the, they, they, well, they, 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 they're on a higher level. That level, being so. said, that being well, said, well, I believe yeah, that, that the key on no matter what level you're at is taking the hand of your Savior. Right. That's it. And repenting. That's the only criteria. Okay? Now, being forgiven of all your sins, you have to repent of those. But his salvation, his being able to save us from death and hell, is not conditional on us. That is totally something he paid for. This is why the Christians get all mad at us. They say, you're all about works. I'm going to say, well, there are rewards based on works. But salvation is his gift. And all you have to do is take his hand. And he'll save you. So, oh, sorry. sorry. Well, one of my favorite talks is The Brilliant Morning of Forgiveness by Boyd K. Packer. Mm -hmm. And that's where he says that no sin will keep you. Like, that's why I say to you, I, I get really cautious measuring sin because right. Jesus said this. He said, Save a few sons of perdition. Yeah. The, save the sons, but they're not put in his power because, because of their agency. He can't violate their agency and they won't take his hand. Okay. He was reading, he was, President Harold B. Lee called him in his hotel room to come read the Gospel Doctrine by Joseph F. Smith, and he said, listen to this, Jesus had not finished his work when his body was slain, neither did he finish it after his resurrection from the dead. Although he had accomplished this purpose for which he then came to earth, he had not fulfilled all his work, and then will he? Not until he has redeemed and saved every son and daughter of our Father. Amen. Now, it's at the end of the millennium. Or ever will be born upon this earth to the end of time except for the sons of perdition. That is his mission. We will not finish yes. our work until we have saved ourselves, then not until we have saved all depending on us, for we are to become saviors upon Mount Zion, as well as Christ. We are called to this mission. Never okay, let me, let me yeah. insert one more thing right there. This is why I get a little eh when we start measuring bigger sins or little sins. Jesus Christ said that he who has been forgiven much loves much. You look through the scriptures. You look at Alma the Younger. You look at the people that got forgiven much. And they spend the every last breath that they have left saving souls. And so, like I say, I, I, have, I have a little bit of a hard time rating sins. Yeah. You know, just take Jesus' hand. That's where I'm at, <laughs> wherever exactly. you are. Okay, you have a hand so here then here. The criteria at the beginning of the millennium then is just good people or? What? No, I would say that it's some risk there, at some risk, because if you're the tyrant, and what, what would happen to people during World War II that helped the Jews? They were risking their lives to feed them to clothe them right. and everything. So what I'm saying is I, I, I don't think it's easy, but I do think that if they were willing to, to help at their own risk, that's, that's a ticket into the millennial day, according to scripture, according to Matthew 25 and the sheep and the goats. We had a hand here, Farrell, and then please make your comment. Well, just, uh, uh, if you 
listen to those who have had near-death experiences. They come back and they say, it's not about what you, what you did, mm -hmm. it's about what you learned. Mm -hmm. And are you learning to give service and to love? And, and sometimes the people that have the darkest paths learned the most. Mm -hmm. More profoundly. You had. I was just going to say, you let the scriptures tell you what the qualification is. A terrestrial glory is the honorable men. Honorable men. Sure. People okay. that were willing to help when someone was in trouble. Fair okay. minded. Okay. All right, let's jump. Um, can you just address the rapture, what you believe is what the Christians call the rapture? Is? Let's address it right here. Okay. okay? <laughs> so we've got, we've got um, a beaming seat judgment. Okay, so this is 2 Corinthians. It says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every man may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether good or bad. So do we throw Paul out with the New Testament now here? Because he just said that there's reward. See, you get silver medal, gold medal, or bronze medal here, okay? <laughs> there's a Bema seat. That's actually what it's called in the Olympics is the Bema seat. Wow. Wow. There's the Bema seat judgment that is about your exaltation, which kingdom you're going to be in, what you did, okay? That is entirely different from being saved from the bands of death and taking Jesus' hand and being saved from hell. That we didn't do. Not a tiny even inkling of it. It was done by three. It was done by the Redeemer. It was done by the Creator. And it was done by the Holy Ghost, who the scriptures say is pleading and moaning our case in heaven. They, the Godhead, paid that price for all of the children. Now, from there we have agency. They will not cross our agency if we will not receive Christ. If they will not buy into the plan, they can't do anything for us. But everyone that will, I have lost none. I, I think it's a beautiful plan. <laughs> I think it's incredible, yeah. and it's all pictured in the prophetic appointments. Okay, here it is in Thessalonians, with uh, Nancy's question, for the Lord himself shall also descend from heaven with a shout. This is our Christian rapture verse, okay? And with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Remember we said that, celestials are first. They help the terrestrials, and the terrestrials help the celestials. Then we which are alive and remain will be caught up. This is translation. We call it translation. The Christians call it rapture. It's the same thing. Okay? Together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord. Notice at the rapture, at the translation, we are caught up and meet him. Okay? That is different than when Jesus Christ comes to reign. It says the saints and come with him and descend. Okay? So those are resurrected people coming down. These are mortal people being caught up. That's the difference. And then the question is, well, which one do, we, do I want to be? And I tell the kids all the time, it doesn't matter. As long as you're on Jesus' team, you know, whether you come with him, whether you're caught up, just be doing what he, what, what he wants you to do, whatever your mission is. Okay. All right, here it is in DNC 78. I love this. That through my providence, notwithstanding the tribulation, which shall descend upon you, that the church may stand independent above all other creatures beneath the celestial world, that you may come up unto the crown prepared for you and be made rulers over many kingdoms, saith the Lord God. The whole point is that we can be righteous rulers to help others. The Holy One of Zion, who hath what? Established, Established the Whoa. foundations of Adam and Diamond. That's where it happens. All right, and here it is. These are the 144,000 redeemed from the earth. And look at this. They are first fruits. Guess where Adam and Diamond falls? It's a double holy day. It's first the fruits. same day, 
first fruits and the seventh day of unleavened bread, the day of deliverance. It's incredible. It's so cool. Here it is in DMC 88. It says that there's silence for a space for a half hour. That's the first half of the tribulation. And then immediately after, the curtain of heaven is unfolded. Those who are alive, the same thing from Thessalonians, those who are alive will be caught up and translated. And guess who they're being caught up to meet? It's the Savior, but it's also the city of Enoch. And all of those guys that we're all becoming one for the grand finale. Okay. They are the what? First fruits. There it is again. The first fruits. Okay. Now we got to move on into the fall feast. Just so you know, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. At that day, when the Gentiles shall sin against my gospel and reject the fullness of the gospel. Guys, can they, is this talking about Biden? Can you reject the fullness of the gospel if you never accepted it? No. Okay, be careful who you apply this to. This is the Gentiles that profess to be Christians. They were part of the ten virgins. We're waiting for the bridegroom. But when the heat comes on, they reject the fullness of my gospel. And um, it says, saith the Father, I will bring the fullness of my gospel from among them. That's why I kept saying, no, they don't join us. We lose it as a nation. But remember, the Is Jew Israel lost it as a nation when they rejected Christ. But how many of those first Christians were Jews? All of them. That's the remnant that's spared. There's going to be the, Christ the Gentiles that are believers. They're the kings and queens of the Gentiles. They're going to come and be numbered with Israel. And from that point on, the scriptures do not call them Gentiles or Israel anymore. He calls them the saints. They become one. Okay? And Gentiles and Israel doesn't matter anymore. Because now it's all a matter about Christ's kingdom. And are you a part of it or are you not? All right, so here's the scary part. Remember in uh, John 4, he went and the woman believed, right? The woman at the well, right? Look at this. In the end time, when he goes back to Samaria in Luke 9, he's on his way to the Feast of Tabernacles in Luke 9. And he sent messengers before his face. Remember, we're in the time of the Gentiles. We're still doing messengers with the Holy Spirit now until he comes. So he's getting ready to come, and he's sending his messengers to the Samaritans to make ready for him, and they did not receive him. Because he likes the Jews. Go figure. They didn't except that it was now time to restore the gospel to Israel and the, all of the branches of Israel. They were doing the exact same thing that Caiaphas and everybody else was doing. No, they can't be part of our club. Okay. Okay, guys, here's a clue. A bit of eyes face shone with exceeding luster, even as Moses did while on Mount Sinai. What was Mount Sinai? What day was that? Shavuot. 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 Shavuot is sevens. Shavuot oat is plural. Shavuot is sevens. <laughs> Seven sevens what we're counting. Okay. It's Shavuot. Abinadi's face shined like Moses. So they have to postpone his trial because there's a holiday going on. Hmm. Go figure. Maybe he went to preach to them during a holiday when everybody would be there. <laughs> oh, no, you shut up. You go into jail until the holiday. And so they bring him out at the end. And he teaches them what? What does he say to them? You're celebrating the commandments. If you're saying you believe these commandments, why don't you keep them? What holiday do they celebrate the commandments? It's Pentecost. It's Shavuot. And I do not know what happened to my slide. <laughs> that was just it weird. I up. hope I didn't just lose all my slides, but oh. yeah, whatever. Okay, so um, now we have, this is the spring feast, is the, the spring ones that we were talking about that were fulfilled at the first coming of Christ. This is the two days of the time of the Gentiles. I always color this one orange because it, remember, Shavuot lands at the beginning of the summer. And so when I think 
summer, I think, orange. I promise you the colors are not in scripture. You don't have to color them the way I do, okay? And then uh, this is the grape harvest, so I always use purple for my second coming millennial time timeline, it's okay? Royalty. And royalty, it's yes. Jesus. But the point with this slide is that when Jesus came, they had the words of Christ. When they rejected the words of Christ, it resulted in Jerusalem being destroyed. The same thing happens at the end of the time of the Gentiles. It says the Gentiles reject the fullness of the gospel. What might be the words of Christ that might come forth at the end of the time of Gentiles that might condemn those that reject them and convert and convince those that do? What book is prophesied to come forth in the due time of the Lord that will trigger the restoration of the house of Israel? How much of the Book of Mormon do we have? The greater part or the lesser part? The lesser part. What part don't we have? The greater part. Yes. What's in the greater part? We don't know. Everything else. Mormon says that we have one one hundredth of what Christ taught them oh. in the lesser part. Guess where the other 99% is? In the hidden records. In the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon. Guess what convinced Lamoni and all the Lamanites in their conversion? Mm. Alma 37. We couldn't have done it without the records. records. Okay. I get excited when I see records coming forth. I even get excited when I see sealed portions coming forth. Because I know that if I was Satan and a real deal was about to happen, I would flood the market with counterfeits. Wouldn't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So... Anyway, that we do the exact same thing, and Brigham Young says so. What about the book of John? We promise we will have the book of yeah. John. Yes, it says that there'll be the sealed portion and other records which yeah. are coming forth. Yes, we are them. actually we can go through the Book of Mormon. We can flesh out quite a few. We should have some of the the books on the brass plates: Zena, Zenic, Neum. Um, we should have the the vision of Mahanrai Moriankamer. Mm. That one's coming forth. And so there's lots of promised records that are coming forth. But this is what Brigham Young said. When he, Jesus, again visits this earth, he will come to, a thir to thoroughly purge his kingdom from wickedness and as ruler of the nations to dictate and administer to them as the heir to the kingdom. And the Gentiles will be as much mistaken in regard to his second advent as the Jews were in relation to the first. Do you think it's important to see the feasts? And the patterns and, and what happens. Okay, this is uh, just another verse here in Hosea, um, which is, Hosea was a prophet speaking to the northern kingdom, to the Ephraimites. And he says, Come, let us return to the Lord. For he hath torn, but he will heal us. There's judgment coming. He has smitten, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. In the third day, we will he will raise us up, and we will live in his sight. Guys, so many people throughout so many generations don't even have a clue what this is talking about. Once you understand the prophetic of Mormons, it per makes perfect sense what he's talking about. Even this part. Then shall we know if we go out and follow to know the Lord that his going forth is prepared as the morning and he will come to us as the rain. Now in Israel, the latter rain is the spring rain. They start the, their harvest cycle in the fall, with, and, and the first rain, so Jesus comes to us first in the spring, and then in the fall. Comes as the rain. Mm -hmm. O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? And Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as the morning cloud, and as the early dew it goeth away. All right. Yeah, here's Ephraim in Hosea. Ephraim has mixed himself among the people, the Gentiles. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Eventually, we have to get the Gentile out of us and be fully converted to the Lord. Strangers, this, see if this describes our nation right now. <laughs> Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Yea, gray hairs are here and there upon him, and he knoweth it not. Like Biden, right? He doesn't know. His, no, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Okay. And the you better cut that out, uh, Nancy. Well, I'll get in trouble. And the pride of Israel testifieth to his face, and they do not return to the pride 
of Israel. Mm -hmm. Are we guilty of this? We think that God needs our permission to do prophecy the way he said he was going to. And they do not return to the Lord their God nor seek him for all of this. Half-baked. There's your 50% fallout again. Okay. Get into the fall feast. This is David Whitmer. He was interviewed by Orson Pratt and Joseph F. Smith. And this was in 1878. This was after the Civil War that happened in America in the 1860s. So wait, did we miss the half-baked meaning that when you keep checking on the cake, then it falls and then it can't rise again because it doesn't have the leaven in it? Which is also an overlay? Nancy, I'm going to have to rewind and listen to that one more time. I love it, though. Yeah, when a cake falls, you can't make it rise again. Right. Very good. Yes. But, but those pieces that are still edible, you can number them with the House of Israel, right? <laughs> Boy, we're torturing the data here. Okay. Um, we, we, Farrell and I say all the time, if you torture the data long enough, it'll confess anything, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we have Orson Pratt and Joseph S. Smith. They're asking David Whitmer what Joseph Smith taught him about the sealed plates. And he said this. Where, where are the plates now? And he says, in a cave where the angel has hidden them up till the time arrives when the plates that are sealed are to be translated. And he says, God will yet raise up a mighty one who will do this work till it is finished and Jesus comes again. And then they ask him, when will the temple be built at Independence? And he says, right after the great tribulation is over. Okay, remember that the, the saints of God have to to, to be, oh, how does it say it in Malachi? It says that they, I will prove them as gold and silver in the cauldron of affliction, <laughs> you know? Okay, um, right after the great tribulation is over. And he says, well, what do you mean by that? And then David Whitmer says this very interesting thing. A civil war more bloody and cruel than the first one. Mm -hmm. And it will be a smashing up of this nation about which time a second great work has to be done, a work like Joseph did. And the translation of the sealed plates and those records will bring peace. What happened when the Lamanites were converted under Ammon, uh, Ammon and the sons of Mosiah? There was peace. And it was said to us that the second great work would commence when nearly all the witnesses of the first plates were gone. And I love this because he thinks Maybe I'll get to do it, you know. I mean, they, they've been saying that since the time of John the Revelator. Yeah. <laughs> when are you coming back, Jesus? Tomorrow? Mm -hmm. I, I think he didn't have the heart to tell him that there's 2,000 years of the time of the Gentiles before. <laughs> two days. <laughs> two thousand I'll be back in two days. <laughs> okay. This is just showing you that this is long after the Civil War that this prophecy was made. And you know, I, I take dreams and visions and interviews with David Whitmer and everything with a grain of salt. The only time I pay attention is when they're lining up with scripture and everything mm -hmm. else, okay? And from what I can see, looks to me like we might be headed for a civil war after an election this year. Ooh.